So here's what sounds like a really simple question. What is it that makes share prices move up and down? The answer, it turned out, was so surprising and so interesting that it won Robert Schiller the Nobel Prize. It also founded a whole new field, which is behavioural economics. But it's not just of purely theoretical interest. It has really practical applications. So let's see what Robert Schiller found out and how it applies to you as an investor. Remember, this is not a recommendation. If you want financial advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Up until the 1980s, there were two central beliefs that drove financial markets. The first one made it very difficult to beat the market. This is called efficient markets. The idea is that market prices reflect every single piece of information which is available. And the second pillar was that markets are rational. If we want to work out the price of an asset, we just work out all of the future cash flows, or guess them, and then we discount them to work out their value today. You can almost think of markets as some kind of rational computer weighing up all of the information and then coming out with one single rational price. But then in 1981, Robert Schiller published this paper, Do Stock Prices Move Too Much to be Justified by Subsequent Changes in Dividends? And this is probably the single most important picture in finance. The gently moving wiggly dotted line is the rational price forecast. Robert Schiller looked at the future dividends that would have been paid in the future from 1870 onwards and then worked out a rational price based on those dividends. When a company generates profits, some of those profits are paid back to you as the shareholder. So the value to you as a shareholder should be the discounted value of all those future dividends forever. Now, at the level of the whole stock market, that doesn't move around much. You can see that the line is fairly sedate in its movements. But then look at the actual stock price. It's moving around much, much more. It's much more volatile, as we'd say in finance. So its typical annual move is much higher than it should be based on the rational price forecast. In other words, there's just too much volatility in the share market. And while that's true in general, it's also true for specific crises. Now, the biggest crisis there's ever been in the US was the Depression, around the years 1930 to 1935. But what Schiller points out is that the market reacted far too much, because the actual earnings on shares didn't dip below the trend by very much or for very long. And yet the Depression generated the biggest spike in volatility that there's ever been in the US. So what Robert Schiller did was to lay down the list of rational pricing factors. What could it be, if we're rational investors, that could generate a change in today's price? Now, a change in any one of these four factors could drive the price of shares up and down. So volatility would be generated by changes in the rational forecast of future cash flows, future interest rates, or future risk. Well, the fourth possibility is that the price of risk changes. So investors become more cautious and they demand a higher price to take risk. The first factor is fairly obvious. If we have two stocks, one of which has rapid dividend growth and the other one which has slow dividend growth, we pay more for the rapid growth. If we think about the risk-free rate, the argument is a bit more subtle. Here are the dividends generated by a company and this is what they'd actually look like. Sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down as the fortunes of the company wax and wane. Alternatively, you could buy a government bond, but of course, this is guaranteed by the government. And remember, the government can usually print money. So if your government has a very good credit history, like the US or the UK, then in theory, you can't make a capital loss on those government bonds. But what you can see here is that the government bond payments are much lower than the share dividends. So you might be willing to take the extra risk of the share dividends because firstly, they're growing, but they're also much bigger than the government bond payments if rates are low. But if the rate of return paid by government bonds increases, then suddenly those very volatile and risky share dividends become much less attractive. And so an increase in the risk-free rate has pushed down the price of the shares. Here's a plot of the risk index or the VIX volatility index for the United States. A big number means that share prices are moving around much more. You can see the spikes are each of the crises since 2004. And the big one is the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Now, if somehow investors had seen that volatility beforehand, 
they'd have realised that share prices are about to become more risky and that would have lowered the price of shares. So since Schiller's paper in 1981, which showed that future cash flows aren't responsible for the changing price of stocks, because they're simply too volatile, other researchers have looked at interest rates and at volatility, and none of those factors can explain the huge volatility in the stock market that we observe. And by a process of elimination, what's generating the huge volatility that we see is the price of risk. Another beautiful observation by Robert Schiller was that stock markets over the very long term are predictable. On the x-axis, you can see Schiller's price-to-earnings ratio. He called it his cape because it's cyclically adjusted. Earnings tend to be very volatile themselves over time, so he smooths them out over a whole decade, which is roughly one business cycle. Then he compares the price you're willing to pay for shares to the earnings that they've generated. In a market bubble, people are willing to pay over $30 for every dollar of earnings. But during a crisis, that falls to below $10 for each dollar of earnings. On the y-axis, you can see the next decade's returns for each level of that pricing measure. And what jumps out is that if the markets are cheap today, in other words, you're willing to pay $10 or less for every dollar of earnings, then during the next decade, returns tend to be higher. Whereas if stocks are expensive today, using his CAPE measure, returns tend to be lower over the next decade. So what is it that's driving risk appetite? Well, there are actually two theories which explain what we just saw. One of them is rational, it's called habit formation, and you can think of it as people liking the lifestyle which they grow used to. The second possibility is called over-forecasting, and this explanation is irrational because what it assumes is that the future will resemble the recent past. So starting with a rational explanation, which comes from John Cochrane, he gives an example of something he heard at a cocktail party. A hedge fund manager's wife remarked, I'd sooner die than fly commercial again. Clearly, she liked her private jets, and she would never go back to flying, even in business. Here it is as a graph, and you can see the consumption line moving up and down, but the habit line, which is the lifestyle you get used to, is moving more slowly, but it generally acclimatizes to higher living standards. So that during a boom, people know that prices are too high, and they know that returns will be low in future, but because they have a secure job and they're earning good money, what else can they do with their money? And that's why they reach for yield and take more risk. So during these times, risk aversion tends to be low, or risk appetite, conversely, would be high. The ratio C over X is consumption relative to subsistence level, and that tends to be very high during these periods. Also, the price of shares compared to their dividends tends to be very high, or another way of saying that is that dividend yield tends to be low, and the ER, which is expected returns, tend to be low. During a bust, people know that expected returns will be high, but because of job insecurity, perhaps the car's about to be repossessed, the whole environment is saturated with fear, so they're worried that markets will carry on falling instead of rebounding, and that makes them much more risk-averse. Their levels of consumption are also low relative to that subsistence level. Risk aversion is high, dividend yields are much higher, and expected returns are high. So in a sense, this slow habit formation change makes it rational to follow the herd during a crisis or in a bubble. Nicholas Barbaris has come up with an alternative explanation which is irrational, where people simply assume that the future will resemble the recent past. He gives the example of this Gallup survey of optimism versus pessimism, and he overlays the past stock return, or at least the recent stock return. And you can see that the recent stock return is very similar to that measure of optimism versus pessimism. If the market's doing well, people are optimistic. If the market's crashing, people are pessimistic. Their views of the future are strongly led by the recent past. Or as he puts it, when forming beliefs about the future, people put too much weight on the recent past. So let's apply this to what happens during a bubble. Robert Schill has written a really nice popular science book called Irrational Exuberance, which is now in its third edition. And he explains the process by which one of these bubbles is inflated. So it starts off with news of price increases. 
This generates enthusiasm amongst some investors. But then there's a process of psychological contagion from person to person. That draws in a larger crowd of investors. Then some people get jealous of other people's success. Or they simply get the thrill of a gambler when they invest in the stock market. He talks about the taxi driver test. If your taxi driver is giving you stock tips, it's time to get out of the market. After the financial crisis, Robert Schiller wrote another book about animal spirits. In fact, it's a really old idea. This was the first time it was mentioned in an economic context by William Wood, where he talks about animal spirits being the driver of the benefits of British trade. And in the book, they identify five factors which generate animal spirits. Confidence, fairness, corrupt and antisocial behaviour, money illusion and stories. And what's really interesting is that he compares the spread of stories to a contagion, just like an epidemic. And of course, this still applies today. Here's a story from the FT in May 2017 about initial coin offerings, or ICOs. Stories about blockchain startups saturated social media in 2016 and 2017. But in fact, it was the Chinese regulators that clamped down on ICOs. And that removed some of the animal spirits in the ICO market. So by reading these two books, you can keep your feet firmly planted during a bubble and during a crisis. Here are some of the practical tips. Firstly, avoid fear of missing out or FOMO. Here's a story about real estate flipping where you can see at the bottom they say there's no question that this has the potential to make large gains. You almost get the feeling that you have to buy today because if you wait until tomorrow, you won't be able to afford it. That's a sign of a bubble. Schiller also warns against money illusion. When he hears stories about fantastic returns over the long term, always consider inflation. So if you buy a house in 1965 for £3,500, that sounds fantastic. That seems like an 11% per year return. But if you factor in the rate of inflation, it's less than 5%. And in fact, you'd have been better off with a stock market over that period. Try and avoid story epidemics. Don't take stock tips from your hairdresser or your taxi driver. This is Warren Buffett's letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders in 2004. Investors should always avoid excitement and expenses. Try to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. If you ever see the word sure winner, that should ring alarm bells that say this is a scam. So here are some examples which talk about guaranteed profit. Whenever you see that, you know that what it's saying is a lie because there's no such thing as a risk-free return. Guaranteed return will always be a scam. And if you ever see someone say that valuation doesn't matter, don't believe them. Valuation always matters. Here's a quote about Yahoo just before the dot-com bubble burst. At their peak, Yahoo shares were worth over $100 billion. But just before its sale to Verizon in 2017, the price of the company was half that. So always try and look at the value of something relative to its fundamental value. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you think markets are rational and that this research is misleading. If so, tell us. And remember, you can work with us. You can book a power hour with Roman, or you could take one of our courses. And if you like these videos, why not subscribe to our channel?